Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Making Milestones podcast. I'm so excited about today's podcast because we have an amazing guest speaker, Renata Larson, who is an equine ethologist, and I'm super excited to have her on because she is the most educated person I have had the ability to interview for this podcast, and she just has such a wide breadth of ex- And she just has such a wide breadth of expertise to share with everyone. And I think everyone's going to get so much learning material out of this podcast. So I hope you enjoy listening to this podcast as much as I enjoyed speaking to Renata. If you're interested in checking out her pages following this podcast, you can check them out at Renata Larson on Instagram or the equine ethologist Renata Larson on Facebook. I highly recommend following her. She has a lot of great information and she is a professional in the industry who has a huge who has a huge level of expertise and education to back her points and her beliefs. So listen up and you'll definitely get something out of this podcast because she just has so much to share. Before we get started, I just wanted to plug some of the other ways you can support this podcast. You can check out my shop where I sell bridles and equestrian apparel. We just released some spring stuff such as different satin lined hat colors as well as turn out your damn horses sweaters that are super cute and I highly recommend checking them out. You can check them out at shop milestone ek shop milestone eq.com and we also are restocking our bitless bridles and our lunging bridles starting this week for the bitless bridles so check that out if you've been looking to get your hands on them and we're also having huge sales on seasonal apparel up to 85 percent off of all fall winter apparel so check that out and help me clear out my stock also you can check out my patreon channel p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash sd E-Q-U-U-S-S-D Equus. You can join for as little as a dollar a month, but if you do the five dollars and a month tiers or above, you have access to all the tutorials that I already have on there. We also do live Q&As behind the scenes and more. It's a great way to help support what I do on this podcast and other aspects of my training and business. So thank you everyone for listening to this podcast and I really hope you appreciate the conversation that is to be had in this podcast because I think it's very timely and needed and I hope that it'll help people in their journey of becoming better horse people. So without further ado, let's just jump into it and let Renata Larson introduce herself and talk a little bit about what she does. And then this is going to be an approximately hour long podcast on horse welfare and important issues that are ongoing in the industry today and suggested remedies and otherwise. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. All right. So my name is Renata Larson. I'm an equine ethologist. Um, That means that I'm specialized in equine behavior. Uh, I have a a bachelor's degree in veterinary medicine, and then I have a master's degree in ethology. And I'm currently doing a PhD looking at human animal relations in the past. So I think I'll start off asking you a question that I'm sure um, a lot of people would want to know because I, we, I read your interview with Horse Network regarding the Carl Cook and Kalinka situation. And there was a certain part of that interview that I particularly liked and that I think is quite a controversial statement, but it was the statement of when you were asked if it's possible to make a horse jump a meter 60 forcibly, you said something along the lines of, I'm going to flip the question on its head and ask if it's possible to make a horse do that without force. So I wanted to talk to you about the upper level horse industry and just kind of what problems that you as an ethologist identify as the most pressing issues within that sector of the horse world that you would like to see addressed? That's a very broad question. Yeah. <laughs> Where do we start? Well, I think the main problem is the fact that we've had quite a lot of developments in the last decade or two when it comes to you know horse behavior, um, different training methods, how different uh, equipment choices affect horses. And I feel like that knowledge that we now have that science doesn't really make it out to you know horse people in general and also you know elite uh writers in particular and i think to me that's kind of at the core of the issue is the fact that we you know, we're, the horse world and i'm saying we because i'm also part of the horse world yeah um, that we don't embrace the science and we see it as a threat rather than as an opportunity mm-hmm Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it because a lot of people don't, the the science makes them feel bad about how they might be handling their horses. So then their means of dealing with it is by 
denying the science itself. And something that I found particularly interesting about a lot of people's arguments against the science is that there seems to be a massive lack of understanding about how these studies are actually run because the amount of times I've had someone rebuttal to me with, oh, you can't test these things in a lab, or they'll say something like that pertaining to studies. And I think there's a lack of understanding about how these studies are actually conducted because a lot of them are conducted in the field, testing on real life horses and real barns and doing them in a blind manner so that the participants don't necessarily know what the study is actually tracking. So since you're in that sector more so than I am because of your master's degree and everything that you do, could you say anything about like the process of some of these studies or like if you can think of one particularly influential study, just talk a little bit about that? Um, so in general, studying animal behavior can be tricky um, because we can't upright ask them how they feel. We can't just, you know, put a horse in a particular situation, ask them, OK, do you like this or not? Do you prefer this other situation? Which bit is better? So instead, what we have to do is we have to observe their behavior and we have to find ways to quantify that behavior and to analyze that behavior. Um, and the study of animal behavior is, a, is, you know, has a long, it's not, this is not a new field. This has a long tradition. Um, there's been a Nobel Prize awarded to ethologists, you know, so this is an established research field. And there are a lot of behavioral um, experiments and behavioral tests that have been validated both in the lab setting, but also in kind of like a real life setting. And I think there is, I understand to a degree, the argument that, well, we can't test these things in the lab, we have to test them in a real life situation. But we do. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, you know, a lot of the times, you, you, the thing is with horses, it's impossible to test them in a lab situation. How are you going to even get, you know, how are you going to, so how are you going to get um, 60 um, horses that are genetic copies of each other? that have been raised in the exact same environment with zero outside influence. Number one, you're not going to get ethical permits for a study like that. Number two, it's just, you know, impossible. So we have to do, especially for these large animal studies, you know, by design, they are done in real life settings. Um, and the interpretations are very cautious. You know, we do one study and the results of one study, nobody's going to go out and say, well, you know, this changes everything. But at this point now in 2023, for a lot of these things that we are saying when it comes to turnout, when it comes to company, when it comes to um, punishment based training methods, when it comes to certain equipment choices, it's not one study anymore. It's study upon study upon study. It's the collected body of evidence from decades of research that we're saying, OK, we have this is this is telling us something. That's it. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. Uh, I, yeah, I think that there's a lot of, um, I guess scientific illiteracy in the general community where they don't necessarily understand how the process works. So they kind of have a misinter misinterpretation of how it works. And I've also had people say that like studies are inherently biased because like companies or people with certain desired outcomes can pay for those studies, which is true. But aren't studies legally obligated to state, like, if someone's giving a substantial amount of money to make the study happen, like, they have to disclose that information. So it's not a secret. It's not a secret if it's peer reviewed and if it's published in one of the established peer review journals, for example, Applied Animal Behavior Science, where my study was published. It's gone through a rigorous peer review process. It's clearly stated if you have gotten any external funding. It's clearly stated you as, as an author, you're obliged to um, disclose if you have any conflicting interests, for example. So these are, you know, and I think it's, we have to flip the question. This is also one of those questions yeah. you have to flip. It's a good thing that companies are actually funding rigorous scientific study of their products. A lot of them don't. They just claim things that aren't true. Uh, so I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Absolutely. That's why you need to, you, you know, you need to read studies and you need to see who's funded them. You need to see, um, you kind of need to read them in a context and you always have to be, I always, you know, say there's certain things, certain results that we can always interpret a little bit more cautiously than others. Uh, but in general, you know, it's not a problem that uh, companies want to fund more scientific research into their products and methods. I think that's a great way of putting it. I guess my next question for you would be, are you able to talk a little bit about the process of publishing your own study and how the peer review process actually works for people who may not be familiar with how rigorous the testing is for that? Absolutely. So for me, so essentially, I'm trying to, if I'm going to generalize it, you have, you know, you have an idea for, it, for a research project. 
And I think um, Franz de Waal, who's also an, he's a primatologist, so he studies primate behavior. But he puts it really nice. He says that the most powerful expression in science is not eureka. It's not, you know, oh, I discovered something. It's, that's odd. I wonder what that is about. Because that's how we, as ethologists, get our inspiration. We look at something, we say, why is that chimpanzee doing that kind of behavior right now? Or what was my horse's behavior over there about? And that kind of feeds into the inspiration for actually then designing studies. And when you design studies, you need to be very meticulous. You want to, for example, make sure that you have an even distribution of male and female horses, because, you know, it can always, there can always be a, um, um, effects of, of, for example, sex and reproduction. So it's nice to kind of have a, you want to try and have a fairly even distribution of male and female horses. You want to try and control the environment that the experiment is done in. So it's done in a fairly similar environment, again, to kind of control for issues such as changes in weather, um, you know, a car backfiring that might affect behavior, all these little things. But then, like I said before, because a lot of horse studies are done in sort of real life settings, there is a, there is always this kind of caution when interpreting them. And that's clearly stated as well in the in the scientific report that these are the limitations. This is what we weren't able to control for. These are the problems. This is what you need to take into consideration. So that's always very, very clearly stated in these papers. And if you read them, you'll be able to see what the authors themselves, because that's part of kind of scientific rigor and honesty to disclose like, we believe in our study, but we're aware of the fact that these things could have, you know, could potentially influence it. And then once you've designed your study and you've designed your experiment, you conduct the experiment and you gather the data. Um, and then you analyze the data. And then depending on what kind of analysis you do, there's often statistical analysis as well, uh, which is, you know, a pain in the butt, but that science, you know, you need to have the statistics, you need to have the probabilities in order. And once you've done that, you write it all up into a report. And these can be the length of this report. I've seen, you know, four page reports. So gen genetic studies tend to be very, very short. The actual kind of the actual paper, because it tends to just be this is what we did. This is what we found. And then you have about two, three pages of contributing authors because, you know, in genetics, you have a much wider kind of collaborative effort. Um, in behavior, like more ethology, you'll see page papers that are between five to 10 pages long. You essentially write up. So you write an introduction, which gives you as a reader an overview of what, what we know up until now. This is the kind of, the, this is what we know up until now about these issues. And then you get the problem statement. This is what we're trying to find out, how we're trying to kind of expand on that uh, current knowledge. Then you describe the method, you describe very in, in a lot of detail what you've done. Then you describe the results and you often have, you know, the statistics and you have the graphs and everything. And then you have the discussion, which is where you kind of put your results into a wider context of previous science and future science. And that's where you also bring up these limitations and you kind of go back and forth between what does this mean? What could this mean? What are some potential um, interpretations? And once you've written that, you submit it to a journal um, that is suitable for your field. And it's for me, within mythology, it's very often applied animal uh, behavior science. It's one of the, the primary journals in my field. You submit it and then it goes into um, a preliminary kind of distribution to reviewers. So you'll always have two reviewers, reviewer one and reviewer two. And in most papers, they'll be anonymous. So, for example, for applied animal behavior science, you don't know who these reviewers are, but they will be other scientists in your field. So they will be other ethologists. And well, they well, sorry, will they know who you are or is that also blind? It depends on. So it can it can vary. Um, I think it varies from journal to journal. Sometimes they're double blinded. Sometimes they're just single blinded. Sometimes nobody, everybody knows who everybody is. So it, it varies a lot. So you can kind of find that information um, on your journal, the journal you choose to submit to. And then these reviewers, once they get your paper, they nitpick it. And I'm not joking. They are they go through every single comma, every single word, cho word choice that you just, you know, and, and comment on everything. And it's a great privilege to have, you know, um, colleagues spend so much time actually evaluating and giving you the attention, evaluating your research and giving you that attention. And there's this joke in science that like reviewer one is always 
kind of nice and lenient and a little bit, you know, more positive. And reviewer two is the butthole. It's like a good cop, bad cop situation. And I'm not joking. It checks out every single time. So there's like, you know, there's this like joke about reviewer two. Uh, And my reviewer two was hard to convince. It was tough love. It was tough love. Um, but that's that's why you can kind of that that's the process to get you know proper science published in a peer reviewed journal. So they will go through and give your initial comments, uh, and they will give kind of first they'll they'll write up just like a general. This is what we think: good things, bad things. And then they will also have made like actual comments in in the word document things to and you know nitpicky like nothing you've ever seen. You know, like change this word. You know, flip the sentence around. And then they send it back to you and then you respond to these comments. So you make the changes or if you feel like, no, they are wrong and I am right, then you argue your case, you know, so you, ha- you argue your case and then you send it back. And then this can sometimes go on for a while. You can get comments back and, you know, and it can go back and forth. And finally, hopefully, um, in the end, you will have satisfied the reviewers um, that, you know, this is now this this whole this lives up to the standard of this journal, this publication, and then it gets accepted and published. So that is the peer review process, and it is really, really meticulous. It's not a joke, and that's why I think you know when people kind of talk about science, oh, it's you know we can trust it because it's been funded, but it's been through, so you know the reviewers are independent, and the reviewers are you know cred- you know credible scientists who are working within this field and are very experienced. So there's always these kind of like checks on the way as well. That's really good to know. Cause yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion where people think that it's like corrupt, but then the problem is like when people like defer to anecdotes, I don't think they realize how corrupt and biased like anecdotal experience is because even if you've been in the industry for like decades, like how you perceive what's going on around you isn't necessarily what is actually happening. It's just your perception of it. And I think that's where people get lost because they'll place a lot of weight in their own anecdotes or their trainer's anecdotes. And we see a lot of misinformation passed down from generation to generation in that way. And I find that particularly concerning because People tend to get offended if you say that their anecdotes aren't like the truth. But the problem is that we need to kind of normalize the idea that like it's okay to be wrong because in this industry, people are really, really sensitive to being told that they're wrong. And I think it impacts people's self-worth way more than it should because there is so much misinformation. Like so many of us have been wrong before and we all will be wrong again for sure as information progresses. Definitely. And I think you're making such an important point there, because I think on the one hand, I think so we project so much of our emotions onto our horses, you know, right there. There's our self-worth is tied to how we care for our horses. You know, we love these animals. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons it becomes so sensitive, because you want to believe that you love your horse and you're doing and you are you do love your horse and you are doing the best you know to do. But then when somebody says, but that might not actually be the best thing for your horse, that becomes a very personal attack. And I think that's why we see a lot of pushback, like emotional pushback, people kind of reacting very strongly against this. I think, I mean, I've I've done horrible things to horses in my life, like awful things that I'm so embarrassed about today, so ashamed of, you know. I've hit horses, I've yelled at horses, I've yanked, you know, yanked the lead ropes, I've done awful things to horses because I didn't know better because I was told that you know get after him show him who's boss we need to you know we've all heard we've all heard these phrases before and you know I think that's also important for people like you and me because we both kind of you know I followed you for a long time now and you know we're both kind of we came from very traditional background and then we've kind of like you know we discovered positive reinforcement training we discovered ethology you know i decided to make it a career so do you i know you're a, a certified behaviorist so i think we have i think our story we think we should be open about our story as well because that helps other people feel like they're not alone in this you know and like you say you and i are probably doing things now with our horses that 10 years from now we'll look back and be like, oh for oh, sure oh, <laughs> yeah for sure Because I think that also should be something that we're proud of, because if you 
go 10 years in the future and you don't see anything wrong with anything you've ever done, you're probably not growing as an equestrian. Like being able to look back and nitpick what you've done wrong, even like 24 hours after a training session, I think is an asset to because none of us are perfect. Like no one here is training in a perfect training session. We all have bad days. And I think that's also something that needs to be normalized is even when you're using really ethical methods, if you're having a bad day where you're cranky or in a bad mood, regardless of what you're doing, it's probably going to impact the quality of your training, even if you're not necessarily being cruel to your horse. And I think that's something that people don't necessarily realize because when they hear people like us talking, I think they take it in from the perspective of us thinking we're better than everyone and never having made those mistakes instead of looking at it through the lens of these people used to do a lot of the things that they now criticize but they've seen a better way and they've seen how it's impacted themselves and their horses positively and that's why they're making these differences now because what i found particularly interesting about using positive reinforcement that i don't think is necessarily discussed enough is like how it impacts human mental health like my mental health when Mm -hmm. i was doing traditional training was terrible i was so angry i had a i had problems managing my emotions and what that inadvertently led to is me taking it out on my horses and i've done terrible things to horses too like i've been so mean to them because like The trainer that I grew up learning from, I've realized now, like, even compared to other traditional trainers, she taught me a lot of really normalized harshness. And I was only four years old when I started training with her. So it's like a four-year-old is never going to have the knowledge and ability to question their trainer in the way that was needed. And the few times I tried, I was made to feel embarrassed for asking questions and, like, I shouldn't ask questions because when trainers can't answer questions, they usually try to make the questioner make feel insecure so that they stop asking. And I think that it's really important to acknowledge the mistakes that were made because yeah, I've done a lot of things to horses that I still to this day feel like really guilty about. And for a while I was so embarrassed about what I had done that I didn't want to publicly admit to it because I thought that it would change people's opinion of me. And I mean, it still could for certain people, but I think it's important to acknowledge that we've all made mistakes and will continue to make mistakes and that it's less about making mistakes and more about how you respond to the mistakes to make a difference for your horse. That's a really, really, really good point you made there. Uh, we should pull that out as a quote and make, you know, one of those Instagram posts about that. Cause it's not, it's, we all make mistakes. It's about how we respond to them, what we learn from them and whether we choose to do things differently down the line. The thing you said about being four years old and like having been learning these harsh methods. So that really just hit home for me because I think most of us learn to ride, you know, at a traditional riding school. At least most of us are adults now, you know, hopefully things are changing. I know Steph K has a positive reinforcement. Oh, I love watching her uh, program. It's so nice to see kids. Oh, yeah. Them. I, when I, oh, first time I discovered, I, I literally cried. I was like, this yeah. is change. This is growth. This is it. This is oh, everything. Was this when I was a kid. But... Yeah. Like her tack room organization and like how she had, <sighs> I love it. Cause from a teaching perspective for humans too, my mom's a teacher and she very much that she's on board with all this stuff too, because people also don't learn well under stress. So it's like the same thing. Yeah. But I I worked as a writing school uh, instructor um, for, for all ages. So like, you know, kids who are just starting out who are like five, I think the, 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 you had to be five to start writing. There's like five, six, and then, you know, adults and the amount of violence and coercion that the adults had to unlearn it was just, and even the kids, you know, even the kids that were 10 years old, you could kind of see that their, their goat, their immediate goat to response that the horse hesitated for a moment at any kind of situation, smack him with the whip. Not because they wanted to hurt the horse, but because that was the, the only tool that was available to them because that's what they had been taught, you know? And More, you're usually pressure, taught, increase pressure. Yeah. You're usually taught it doesn't hurt the horse. Like they'll literally yeah. tell you it does not hurt yeah. the horse. Yeah. And then that's what kids believe because. Yeah. I don't think any child starts out riding wanting to hit their horses because they love them so much. Like I used to just enjoy literally just being within like seeing distance of horses, much less like riding them didn't really matter. But I learned to prioritize all those things more because that's what was modeled to me by everyone around me. And that's the interesting thing. It wasn't just one or two role models. It was like everyone. So you never really saw anything else. And like also back then, social media wasn't really a thing. So you had no means of like accessing how other people did things. You just saw what was around you. 
I think as well, you know, kids are incredibly perceptive, right? Kids are perceptive. They're empathetic. They're not, you know, they don't have all the layers of trauma, hopefully, that we kind of gather as we as we age, as we become adults. And I noticed that as well, you know, the, the kids who were just learning to ride, maybe like six, seven years old, they didn't want to pull on the reins. You know, and I was like, no, like, you know, you got, because it was a traditional, right? So I was like, no, like, you can, you know, you can pick up the reins. And they'd like, they'd hold them like little tiny little birds, you know, like we're afraid to hurt them. I was like, no, it's okay. You can pull the reins. And they just like lift their hands a little bit. Don't even make, you know, wouldn't even like make any contact with the horse's mouth. So I'd be like, no, like you, you want to feel that little contact. And then as soon as the horse responds to release, and they would literally tell me, like, I don't, but doesn't that hurt the horse? I don't want to pull his mouth. It is like so intuitive. And what do I say that I'm like, yeah, no, it does. But that's kind of what we do around here. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's it's incredible. It was like, oh, it was so it was so difficult to navigate around that. Because on one hand, I want to say, like, yeah, it does hurt. You know, like that's why that's how, you know, negative reinforcement works. It's something unpleasant that the horse would rather not experience. But, yeah. you know, and it was that's interesting. Hard. I tried to teach them a little bit about, you know, operant conditioning and learning theory and talk a little bit about that. But I realized how how difficult it is, because when you actually start breaking down the science and explaining how pressure release works, you know, explain how quickly negative reinforcement can turn into positive punishment, people become appalled. You know, and like these kids were completely traumatized after my you know, theory lessons. Because they're like, is this what we're doing? So it is it's it's difficult. Yeah, it's 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 like once you remove the veil, you cannot unsee it. And in some ways, ignorance definitely is bliss. Like I can see the appeal of not knowing because then you can like go to horse shows and like look around and enjoy it and take it all in and just go like, wow, these horses are amazing athletes Mm -hmm. and not see all the bad parts. But at the same time, like I would say my relationship with horses has changed a lot because of it. And like, I've also noticed how much safer I am. And the thing you said about kids was interesting too, because I've actually found that with adults, so long as they've not been introduced to horses beforehand, because I've been teaching my boyfriend how to handle horses. And it's the same thing. Like he, even leading them, like he doesn't want to pull on the lead rope at all. And like, so gentle, like picking out hooves, like touching their hoof, like it's made of glass. And I'm like, no, you need, I was like, they won't feel it so long as you're not stabbing into their frog. Yeah. Like, just go at it like you're digging like into dirt because you need to get all this yeah. out. But so gentle and doesn't want to do anything. And like now when I take him to horse places or he looks at horse stuff online, he's just like, how is this legal to do? Yeah. Like, I don't understand why all this stuff is like so OK to do. And he hasn't even seen like half of it. And I found that so interesting because he is naturally more intuitive than a lot of lifelong horse people where he'll notice things and say things. And I'll just be like, whoa. Like, hold on. Like, how did you already like know? Like, you don't know enough about these animals to be coming up with these concepts. But I think it has to do with how he's not been introduced to the industry with an inherent bias towards really coercive training methods. And it's been really cool to watch. That's really interesting. I've had the exact same experience with my boyfriend because he's so he's an ethologist, but he's not a, he hadn't even barely seen a horse in his life before he met me. So he also understands a little bit about animal behavior. And, you know, we've watched like the like the Olympic dressage competition to cure or something. And he was she's like completely, you know, mouth open, staring at the TV screen. He's like, but I don't get it. Like, what is the point system? Is it the more uncomfortable it is for the horse, the higher the points? I don't, he literally couldn't understand what was going on. <laughs> And I remember, you know, he was helping me out when I was working at this writing club. And he was because we were a bit understaffed. And he was helping out, helping to bring in the the horses one day. And he's just like, you know, comes up here. And he didn't know which, like, which stable this particular horse was going into because he hadn't learned all the routines. So he just, like, stopped some. And it was, like, a lot of, like, private. He's just, like, you know, like, horse owners, like, private owners at that place. So he just stopped some. like, excuse me, which cell does this one go into? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> To him, you're like, well, there's bars on the window, so it yeah. must be a sign. It does, like, I, that's fair, yeah. I just love when we get to see the world, because it's, it, we, because even, like, I have become so habituated to it. Oh, yeah, you know? same. Like, I brought up, I had someone asking me about, like, like what working at the racetrack was like and like talking about like a lot of the stuff that they see in the media and I told them like the good parts of it but then I was like yeah and I brought up lip chains and their jaw dropped like they they were like open mouth and I was like and I was saying it casually because it's something that I've kind of had to habituate to because if you're really reactive and sensitive to it it's overwhelming and you cannot cope like it's just too much if you actually fully take in 
the degree of discomfort horses are in with certain practices. And it happens so rampantly that you kind of have to, to some extent, just shrug it off and keep going and not be overwhelmed by it. But like watching how other people react to it has been something that has been really interesting to see because it just shows how even people who aren't wanting to participate in that, there's a certain extent of like brainwashing and like normalization that causes us to be more comfortable with things that like people on the outside are just like appalled by. And they're like, what? Like pardon. And like, it, it's, it's very interesting. It was really interesting to see the reactions as well to the last Olympics. Um, because I think that, you know, the public outcry, cause it was a, it was, it was a shambles. Like what was going on? It was, it was really, it was not it's so embarrassing. Like it so was embarrassing. Really embarrassing. It was and it sucks because then that's what everyone views all horse people with. And I think that a lot of the really like militant vegans yeah. or like organizations like PETA, they are against all horseback riding when in theory, I think that if you actually broke it down and showed them like how positive reinforcement training works, they at least would be like neutral towards it. I don't think they'd have the same level of hatred, but it sucks because we get roped in with everyone else that's being blasted on the TV and virtually none of those people train with positive reinforcement. Yeah. Or not even they don't even come close. I think. Yeah. I, and I think I think. God, these are so these are such big issues, and there's so much to be said. But I think you know, in, a, a general issue in horse sport is that you know we're not taught horse behavior and how horses learn at riding in like at a riding school. You know, I never learned. I had no idea. I got you know. I trained horses and I had absolutely no idea how they were yeah. functioning. Or operant conditioning. You can't explain like how what you're doing actually yeah. affects the brain, which like same thing. I started training and I wouldn't have been able to be like breaking down what quadrants I'm using and like how, how it actually feels to the horse. And like, honestly speaking, like legally people really shouldn't be allowed to train or teach like horses or other animals or humans for that matter, if they don't understand the process of learning. I think I think you're really hitting the nail on the head here because the horse training industry and is completely unregulated in most countries. I, I can't think of a single country where it's it's regulated, and that even means that people who have no formal qualifications and no proper experience are can call themselves trainers, can give behavioral advice, and then we create this kind of environment of almost like superstition where just you know you have these like so I'm gonna so you know there's this like phenomenon in the horse world I don't know if you agree with me but they're like um, male trainers getting like a cult following um I've joked been... about that yeah if I, if I, <laughs> yeah. I kind of want to make an account where I dress up as a man and use a voice modulator and do everything that I'm already doing and just see how different the response is if I was a man because yeah and there is this, like, you know, we can, and because nobody actually understands that there is a science behind this, that we actually know a few things about how horses behave, how they feel, how they learn, then it just becomes anything goes. You know, you can kind of package anything in whatever terms you want, and you can sell it. And then people think, well, this is a method. And this is, you know, like, all these methods everywhere. I mean, it's all just negative reinforcement and sometimes positive punishment. All yeah. these methods everywhere, but they're all just like the same thing. I view it as such a red flag when someone coins their own method for something yeah. because usually they're all just made up of stuff that's already existed for like decades and decades. And yeah. it's like, I, I understand that everyone has a different program and how they like apply the methods, but we're all applying operant conditioning principles full stop and everyone's doing the same thing just and I think every trainer should disclose what reinforcement they mainly work with. You know, and it's not that everybody's working with reinforcement. There's no such thing as not working with any reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Everybody's doing something and just disclose, you know, is it mainly pressure release, mainly negative reinforcement? That's fine. But just, you know, be honest, it's kind yeah. of like, you know, market yourself with what you're actually doing. The and education's way, so poor. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I've seen people call negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement, because they'll say the relief of pressure is the reward. That's like a term that people love. And then. It's like, that's also dishonest because it's teaching people that the horse is getting positively reinforced yeah. by the relief of pressure when it doesn't make sense in practice. And I think it's, these are incredibly vast areas of scientific research, you know, that have been going on for decades. Obviously, it's going to take a while 
for you know somebody who's just kind of learning about this to really properly unravel and dive into it. And yeah, there are always nuances, but the basics, you know, the quadrants, they're very, they're a good starting point for a riding school to you know before you get before you even get to sit on a horse, you have to understand that the horse thinks, feels, responds, and learns through the consequences of its actions. That's not you know it's it's quite simple you can break it down into something that is easily digestible for both you know younger and older writers and i think that should just be on every single writing school curriculum that should be oh, yeah. basic yeah like a lot of writing schools have the dressage training period on the walls pyramid on the walls and you could put the quadrants of operant conditioning on the walls in the same thing and have it in front of everyone so that when they're walking by they can keep reading it because i understand that sometimes you need to hear the same thing over and over and over and over again before it finally clicks and you can actually remember it enough to explain it on the fly without looking at the material and even just like talking about release so that again i'm going back to my experience as a writing instructor you know we're not people are not taught to release they're Mm -hmm. taught to pull and they're taught to kick but they're not taught to relax their leg and you know give the rein once the horse responds so even that is just faulty even if you're teaching the mechanics you're not teaching the mechanics properly so i you know that was my pet peeve i went on and on and on and on about it for lessons and lessons and lessons like release release when the horse responds you give the reins Mm -hmm. and in the end i got to a point where you know the kids not the adults they were us adults were hopeless you know once we were, yeah. our habits are ingrained it takes ages but the kids you know they would start doing in the end you know they you know everybody made a you know halt and they you know take the reins up and as soon as the horse stopped they just like throw the reins forward <laughs> on the horse's neck and i was like okay we will correct and so now let's pick up the reins a bit yeah. so we maintain some safety but yeah um but then you know it's again i'm just spinning off of that these poor riding ponies you know no wonder they need to be kicked and beaten with a whip to get them to move they're they're like i mean i i struggle to see any ethical way to operate a traditional riding school and yeah i would never want to sell one of my horses into that scenario just because of that like i think that realistically the only way to run it ethically which would be hard because a lot of parents wouldn't like this but like would be to teach the kids from the ground up for like quite some time and you could use stuff like barrels and stuff to help them practice posting and help them practice their balance and hands before ever putting them on a horse or doing stuff like where if they do go on the horse, they don't have access to the reins, kind of like what the Vienna Riding School does. Yeah. I know they have bad horsemanship, too, in certain aspects. But that's something that they do where it's like really prioritizing the rider's seat and their hands. And I don't think like a lot of schools are about instant gratification and like getting the kids to do like ride right away. Um, and I've seen it even like when the child is like terrified of horses and it's like, if they're afraid of the horse on the ground, they do not under any circumstances need to sit on the horse's back yeah. yet. Let them build their confidence from the ground and be less afraid of the horse and then put them on. Otherwise you have these kids that are crying and sobbing on the horse and they're forced to finish the lesson because that's what their parents want since they're paying for it. And then they either like don't like riding because of it even if they started out loving horses they lose their love for horses or they're just put in a position where they're taught that they're supposed to be uncomfortable and perpetually out of their comfort zone and just go through the motions of what they're told to do which also isn't good you know i think it's also an empowering empowerment question you know we're we're and the safety you know safeguarding issue we're taking kids and we're putting them on ginormous animals and we're absolutely not telling them anything important about how these animals behave and respond and how they can influence them properly and just you know like the that empowerment that I noticed in some of my students once we started talking theory we started talking behavior and ethology we started talking about the operant conditioning when they were able to troubleshoot they could go in a lesson and you know the horse would be afraid of something and I'd be like okay what are your tools what can you do and you know and you'd see how they'd suddenly feel empowered because they knew what to do in this situation they weren't just terrified they were like okay i can dismount and lead her past i'm like that's a really good idea that's i think you should do that you know yeah. and then you know they'll ask like oh can i give her a treat while we pass this scary thing i'm like i think that's a wonderful idea just kind of see how they start thinking in terms of you know motivation so we had a horse that didn't want to you know counter and you know the writer was thinking think well you know could it be so you know this is an, this is an irish pony right it's like important yeah I think, could, is it possible that this pony has been driven and not ridden before? That's very, very possible. 
So that means that he's used to having another horse next to him by his side. He's not used to walking, you know, in a line like that. I'm like, that's quite possible. So can we try cantering two and two? Try it. And work like, you know, work like a charm. And just like to see them kind of that empowerment when they kind of understand that these animals, they can truly build that partnership, that bond that everybody's talking about, but nobody's yeah. very, very few people are doing. That's amazing. To well, see. and instructors aren't always going to be around forever either. And that's the thing is there's going to be moments where people have to troubleshoot on their own. And I think that the way the horse worlds run currently is to make people hyper dependent on their coaches um, to the point where like at horse shows and stuff, it's like the norm to like always go with your trainer no matter what. And it's kind of frowned upon to go on your own, even though like in theory, when you've been riding for a while, if like so long as you're not competing above like what your level of knowledge is, you shouldn't all like be that reliant on lessons all the time. Like I like the way I do lessons and stuff now is like where it's like you go and you help them and you give them like homework and tools to do with their horse. They work on those tools and then you can come in and check on them again. And the purpose isn't to be like, oh, we're doing like weekly lessons or we're doing like three lessons a week or two lessons a week. It's about giving them tools and then have helping them continue to expand on those tools. And obviously with, with brand new beginners, that's not the way it should be because they need to be supervised. But when we're talking people that like own their own horses and they've been riding for a while and they know enough to get by, like, I think that it's a flawed system to make them so reliant on like their coaches that like when they encounter a problem, like they need their coach to get on the horse to fix it. Like they don't know how to handle it at all themselves and have no tools to do so because that's an indicator that they haven't really learned enough. And it puts people in a situation where they feel helpless. And when you feel helpless and your coach isn't around and stuff goes wrong, that's when you're probably the most likely to react really unfairly to the horse because you're scared and there's no one there to help you. That is such a good point. Yes, of course, you know. Because you, you feel you've lost control, you're not sure what you're doing, you're scared, and then instinctively we react aggressively. Uh, and that often, you know, manifests as punishment, because punishment gives us <clears throat> gives us a semblance of control. Wow, that's a very good point. Yeah. Definitely. And I think that, like, with uh, how horse people handle horses, like, a lot of how, what we, like, basically, I'd say all of what we do that's really harsh, like, all of the harsh bits we see, harsh training gadgets, how people encourage punishment whether people are willing to admit it or not it's coming from a place of fear because if you weren't scared of your horse you wouldn't be paranoid about them doing all these bad dangerous things all the time to the point where you're willing to justify methods of handling that that are inherently unfair to the horse and i think that like the, that's the biggest problem is the in the industry is people get scared because they don't know how to handle something and as soon as you don't know that's where all these problems arise and people are the most compelled to take it out on the horse because what they're actually reacting to is their internal frustration because they don't know what the next step to do is and then they're mad at how their horse is behaving and they take it so personally when the horse is just being a horse but they take it as the horse being like out to get them and doing something specifically to spite them. And then also, you know, if your only tool is pressure, the only thing you've ever been taught is pressure. And that, that's the only tool that's available to you. So that's what you're going to use. You know, you're just going to add more pressure and that didn't work. So you add a little bit more and you, you know, clamp the nose band shut and you put longer spurs and you smack doors with a whip and you smack it again. That's, because that's all you know how to do and you have absolutely no idea what other options are out there. I will say as well, though, that, you know, I think fear drives a lot of the aversive um, methods and, and equipment out there. But I also think that it's not sufficiently penalized in competitions. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. And even rewarded. Oh, yeah. High scores. So obviously there's these like there's this push and pull that kind of, you know, feeds into this culture of violence that we're currently seeing. Yeah. And we see people that just want like they want instant gratification. It's like, oh, my horse is rushing fences instead of like dealing with their balance or the reason why they're rushing. Let's just slap a harsher bit on. And I think it does come down to the show organizations to not allow that because there's some things that are allowed in like the show jumping ring that it's like there is no justifiable reason to allow people at the upper levels to enter the arena like this, because if they need those things, they do not need to be in the arena. Full stop. They don't deserve to be there. They need to practice more. They need to get their horse better prepared and then go in. Like if you need a double twisted wire gag bit with like a rope noseband and a flash to go into the meter 60 ring, you do not deserve to be there because you're lacking the experience to be there. And I haven't personally seen any studies on it, but a theory that I have is that 
if we actually tested like crashes, falls, accidents, or horses who are making the most mistakes on course or whatever their chosen discipline is and looked at the equipment being used, horses and harsher equipment, I don't think are the safer ones. People will use that safety as an excuse to use the harsher equipment, but most of the horses who are wearing the most gear are actually the most out of control because that's what's necessitating the gear in the rider's eyes. And particularly in five-star eventing on cross country, I would be interested to see statistics about like falls and re- like people who retire on cross country um, or like get the most refusals or even if they finish the course who have the most, I guess, unpleasant rides to watch and look at the equipment that they're using and kind of see if there's correlations between how harsh it is and the way in which they ride. I I don't know of any studies it would be really interesting because I think you might have a point there. It's definitely a very viable hypothesis, but it just made me think of, I don't remember when this was, which competition, but Ingrid Klimke, she was going across country and, you know, one of the absolutely like top level, most like, complicated courses. And she, I think it was on her horse, Bobby in a snaffle, you know, and horse had ears, you know, it just looked yeah. so harmonious and they just, you know, they just fluidly, they just like, you know, sailed over all the obstacles. There was no sharp tugging, no, you know, nothing. And they just look, and that's the thing. So pretty quote, to watch. It is so pretty yeah. to watch. And who said that? There's this quote by um, one of the great masters, uh, Charles the Comfy, I don't remember, but he says, um, good writing is distinguishable from bad writing because in good writing, there's nothing to see. Yeah. I think there is some truth in that, isn't there? Yeah, it should be boring because Michael Young yeah. is like Ingrid Klimke and like where he, um, he uses most, like he does cross country in a snaffle and like his horse, and he also has the best dressage test. Like he always, like always kicks ass at dressage every single time he goes into the arena without question and like easily like beating people by several points. And then he goes and rides perfect cross country every time. And it's, interesting to me how people don't look at riders like that and like the degree of success that they consistently have time after time after time and look at what they're doing with their horses and like what they're riding in because it's like it's no coincidence that the horses who perform the best in dressage are oftentimes the ones who require the least amount of equipment for show jumping and cross country and it's because their riders put the work in on the flat to make that possible on course i can't think of a fall that ingrid klimke or might be young have had on the cross country. I'm trying to think. It must have been ages ago if they've had one. Yeah, but nothing think, recently. Yeah. Right? Nothing, you know, nothing. Because they're running. always winning. And if they fell off, they wouldn't be winning. So, like, that's the thing is they're always in the top, like, three spots usually of, like, the scoreboards, at least from what I've seen. Um, and, yeah, I can't think of one either. I wonder if we also need to redefine success when it comes to competition, because obviously, you know, success is winning. You know, you can be the winner or you can be first loser. And there's, you know, very clear kind of quantification of success. But I wonder as well if we need to talk a little bit more about success being, you know, your horse not getting injured or dying or, you know, you your horse looking actually having good welfare as you compete. Perhaps, you know, perhaps a fourth place on a happy horse in a snaffle should be considered a better um, yeah. example of success. And I think that's up to us. That's up to us as viewers. That's up to us as fans, as, as you know, um, as, as the audience, as the public to kind of, you know, lift the good examples and just, you know, sure you won, that's good for you, but we didn't like that, you know. Twist yeah. Gag, so. Yeah. Cause currently welfare is not a prerequisite to win anything in the horse world. And I think that's also a problem because people will use how often riders win as a justification for like how happy their horses are. Mm-hmm. Cause there's this belief that we can't make horses perform to that level. Um, like that, that they wouldn't do it if they were forced to, but then, it's interesting to me because when you look at it in theory and like, like I, I think people have to almost work harder to not see it at a certain point because when horses do say no, no one ever goes, Oh, just like stop and like take their no for what it is. It's like, Oh, get after them. He's being disobedient. He's, he needs to like get disciplined. That behavior is dangerous and unacceptable. And it's like, Every single time, generally speaking, in a traditional program that the horse tries to exercise their right to say no, it's shut down. And when you repeatedly do that, they learn that the only acceptable answer is to just go where they're pointed. I don't know if you've ever seen that video of that one cross-country horse from a few years ago where the rain broke after a jump. And instead of going between the open gap, like in those large fences, he literally jumped face first into like an eight-foot fence. Um 
And if that doesn't speak for the fact that we've trained horses to just go where they're pointed and have no self-preservation, I honestly don't know what does. And I think that if more riders were actually honest with themselves, they would and looked at how they handle it when their horse does not do what they want, they should be able to realize that horses will do things when they don't want to, because when they tell us they don't want to, we make them do it anyways. This is, again, one of those situations where, like, how the practice is so, so you know, removed from, you know, the science, because this is not what you're saying now. It's not a controversial opinion in science. This is exactly this is exactly what happens when we train horses. We replace some of their, you know, innate behaviors with trained behaviors so that they will perform those instead. There have been studies that have looked at compliance, you know, what you said, the fact that they wouldn't do it unless they liked it. Well, you know, there have been studies that have looked at, you know, horses that cross over uh, like a, a tarp, a tarpaulin, right? So it's a scare, it's yeah. kind of like a novel ob- obstacle, something to scare. The horses that you, so they had like different horses and you'd think that the horses that cross faster would be more okay with it than the ones that kind of tried to get away and, you know, tried to refuse for longer, but not necessarily. Some of the horses that would cross, you know, fairly, you know, would comply, they had very high stress levels and were incredibly scared, but they have this kind of, you know, again, behavior is not necessarily or lack of refusal is not a good indicator of whether a horse is actually okay with doing something or not. And we have the whole, you know, mechanism of shutdown, learned helplessness as well. In addition to this, but this is just, you know, training. This is just replacing, um, yeah. you know, re- I, I, you know, replacing innate behaviors such as fear responses with, you know, desirable behaviors trained behaviors and this is exactly how training works you know paul mcgreedy says that training is more about equine exploitation than equine enlightenment and he's one yeah. of you know the gurus in the field this is but it's just i think it's i think it's because we like we nurture the idea of you know the horse human partnership so much and i love the idea too you know it's not it's it's you know a lot of you know a lot of cultures in the world are built on the idea of the horse human partnership it's such a a strong symbolic image, you know, the centaur, the, you know, all all these myths and legends, and you can find them in a lot of, you know, cultures and societies around the world. And I think that's probably what makes it so difficult to kind of acknowledge that, wait, maybe my horse isn't excited to go to the Olympics with me. Yeah. Maybe my horse is miserable at the Olympics, but I'm doing this for my sake. And I think that's a difficult realization for a lot of people, which is why we're getting so much pushback. Yeah, and I think that people need to reframe the idea of partnership because if one side of the partnership always gets what they want and the other side basically never does, it's not really a partnership, it's a dictatorship. Like partnership should be a conversation, in which case it's like if your horse does say no, that's where you should be like, okay, why are they saying no? Um, and look at it there because also it's an injury prevention tactic. If you don't let your horse have self-preservation to say no, and you just assume that you know exactly why they're saying no and that they can't possibly be in pain, then you can end up riding them to the point where they sustain a career ending injury. And then at the time you realize what you've done, it's too late. So I wish more people would just kind of look at partnerships like a conversation where it's like, if you actually want to have a partnership with your horse, sometimes that means not getting what you want. And it's kind of the same in human relationships too. Like to have an actual good friendship, it's give and take. If you tried to make friends with someone and you always wanted to get your way and you never deferred to them at any point, eventually they would probably use the autonomy that humans have to no longer be friends with you because it's not, reinforcing them whatsoever it's causing them distress and it's impacting their welfare but horses can't leave (laughs) yeah that's the thing you know if we if we constantly control another person's everyday life everything they do everything you know every you know we decide where they're allowed to be when they're allowed to eat uh what they're forced to do We, we you know expose them to forced exercise that's an abusive relationship oh yeah and I think if we want to talk, if we want to humanize our kind of relationship with our horse, if we want to talk in these terms, then we need to kind of start engaging with these very difficult topics as well. That, you know, is this yeah. really the kind of relationship we want to have with our horses? Oh, exactly. And I think it's sad, too, because I don't think a lot of people realize how little autonomy most horses have. Like, if you look at the five basic freedoms of animal welfare... I would say the vast majority of horses do not have all five. Like, And it's sad because it shouldn't be the majority that aren't fulfilling what is considered the bare minimum welfare requirements. 
But, like, even just the act of, like, keeping horses, like, in small individual pens where they can't walk around. And I know that, like, urbanization affects that for sure. But even still, I would say that with what we know now, there are ways that we could construct barns in urban areas way better for horse welfare than what we're doing currently. And there's just no effort for that because people are overwhelmed by the aggressive behaviors that they see in horses who are poorly socialized. But what I find particularly interesting is if you reference that with people and you went, if you took a child and you raised them in isolation and the parents controlled everything they did, like including their playtime, their playtime is not playtime. It's structured playtime because the parents are making them do what the parents think they should be doing. The kid never gets to do anything for themselves and then just took them and tried to throw them out in a room full of other pr- properly socialized children. The poorly socialized one is probably going to either cause problems with the other kids or shut down or panic and be really, really anxious because they will not know how to adapt to that environment. And I wish that more people would view horses that way because when you take a horse that's been stalled 24-7 and just throw it out in a field, they're going from having virtually no stimulation all the time to being in a highly stimulating environment. And it's like, how can you expect them to cope with that well? And some horses cope better than others, but it's it's not fair to expect them to cope well. And then if they don't go, oh, they must hate turnout, it's time to put them back in their stall. And I think, you know, the whole, they must hate turnouts. Okay, well, take a look at your turnouts. So number one, take a look at whether your horse is actually been properly socialized. That's first. But then, then, you know, after that, take a look at your turnout. Is it a barren, tiny, muddy field? And you feed your horse, you know, grain or oats or whatever in, in the stable? Is that the only place they get really tasty food? Is that the only place they get to meet their friends? Is that the only place they have shelter? No wonder they're going to want to come inside. And when people have, you know, we have to kind of give the outside that our horses live in the same attention that we give the inside, you know, and we have to put in the effort of keeping the fields, <clears throat> keeping fields clean, keeping them dry, as dry as possible, um, making sure they have fresh, clean water, making sure they have access to forage and friends, making sure they have shelter if we're living in in, uh, in places with fairly severe climatic conditions, whether that be cold or, you know, or, or sun, that's a thing. Horses need shelter from the sun as well. So it's not about the fact that, oh, they love being inside. It's probably that they hate being outside in the field that you yeah. provided for them. That's a bigger problem. Yeah, and I found it interesting, too, that, like, if a horse displays unwanted behavior that's, like, consistent with not wanting to do something, like, for example, refusing fences, if it's to do with something the rider wants to do with them, they are willing to put the work in to fix the behavior. But when it's something that directly impacts the horse's welfare and their lifestyle, the same work isn't put in. And I guess my hope is for anyone listening to this podcast is that they consider that perspective because if you're willing to put more work in to help things for your horse for your benefit than you are for their day-to-day benefit, despite all of the studies that we have linking heavily increased colic risk to time spent isolated inside with little room to move around because it's not even just for the mental component. It's like if you your horse's physical welfare is going to be damaged if you don't prioritize those things. But If we truly want to have a partnership, the level of effort put in to help the horse adjust to things that are for their best interest and their welfare should be the same, if not like ideally better than what we're doing to get them to do what is for our interests. And it almost never is. It almost never is. So the FEI, uh, the Independent Ethics and Welfare Commission recently um, um, published a few recommendations for the FEI that I think are really good. And one thing that they're focusing on is what they call the other 23 hours. And I think that might be the most kind of actionable thing that you as a horse owner, as a competitor can change for your horse is just making sure that, sure, just decide that this is what I want to do with my horses, why I keep horses and I want to keep competing. That's fine. But then just put in that extra effort to make sure that the other 23 hours when you're not competing are really top notch from a welfare perspective. Make sure that your horse really gets the forage uh, they need that they get the free movement they need um, that they get to move around without a attack without a rider in an enriched environment that they get to socialize with friends and again they don't get to choose so in, you know in, in in a natural state horses would choose their groups mm-hmm. they would leave as social groups they're not comfortable in and they would kind of find they would find their their gang we can't really let them do that because we decide who our horses socialize with. But even then, you know, try and put in a little bit of effort and thought into who likes whom. Do we have even pairings? Can we move some horses around and see? Can we trial different 
uh, constellations, just so our horses can be comfortable. And I think if we if we if we can start thinking more about these other twenty three hours and really making them horse friendly, um, and there's plenty of signs, and we know what horses want. You know, this isn't up for debate anymore at this point. Yeah, we know what they need. They need friends. They need forage, and they need freedom to move. If we can just provide that, then I think a lot can be uh, a lot can be salvaged. Oh, for sure. And I think that if people started to do that, like it would also render a lot of the harsh, aversive methods that we see obsolete because the problems that quote unquote necessitate those methods would cease to exist. And I don't think a lot of people actually realize how much of a difference in behavior the management component makes until you see it. Because for me, it was eye opening when I moved my Arabian show horse from like a show barn where he was in like a square crusher paddock that was probably 20 feet by 20 feet for like maybe six to eight hours a day. And then the rest of the time in a stall, all individual turnout. And then I moved into a 20 acre field with group turnout. And like he went from spooking at shadows on the ground, bolting under saddle to being beginner safe. And when you see it like that in plain sight, like you can't really deny the research anymore because it's like you're seeing a horse that you've ridden for however many years do a complete 180 with no other changes to training. It's just the change in management. And I wish more people would realize how many problems that would solve because it would also save them money. You're not going to be paying tons of money on training to fix problems that are caused by management. They're not training problems. They're behavior problems from how the horse is managed. And a lot of people can't do that. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. I think, you know, the, especially with all the behavior and training issues, you know, if you start from the basics, most, I, I'd say, you know, 99% are just going to get solved like that with the snap of the fingers. If yeah. It's easier like than that. people think it's less complicated than what people think, I think. And then, but it's just taking the first step. That's so hard for people. So yeah. Thank you so much for having this discussion. I think, it, yeah, I, I think you said you needed to go. So um, at this time, so we can, call it and yeah i hope to have you on again to discuss more things because this was really great and i think that it'll give people a lot of useful information i'm glad you liked that i'd love to be on again and thank you for thank you for you know thank you for having this discussion in a very public place on your social media on your um uh, youtube channel and also on your podcast i think it's really important that we just like you said sometimes you need to people need to hear things a few times yeah uh, to internalize it so i think this is really valuable and i hope uh i again i hope we can talk soon again yeah perfect thank you so much and have a great day and yeah Mm -hmm. i really appreciate you coming on here So I hope everyone enjoyed this podcast and found it as educational as I did. I really appreciated Renata talking about her previous experience in the traditional horse training world because I think an important part of this discussion is just normalizing the fact that a lot of the people now who are promoting change in the industry and wanting to better equine welfare were guilty of problematic practices that they may now speak out against. So it's not a journey of perfection and never making mistakes or always committing to horse welfare. It's a journey of self-betterment and doing the best that you can for your horse with the knowledge you have at any time and just being open to changing that knowledge, really. So I really encourage everyone to really consider what was talked about in this podcast, and I would love to hear your thoughts on the podcast. If you enjoyed it, please share it because I think that this conversation is important and I think hearing someone as experienced as Renata talk about mistakes that they've made in the past is huge because it'll help normalize the idea that everyone is coming from a place where they would have been less experienced or where they would have made mistakes that would cause horses harm. Thank you everyone for tuning in to the Making Milestones podcast. I appreciate all of your support and I thank you for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to check out Renata's pages. Don't forget to check out my pages on Patreon or my shop page and the like. All of the links for that are going to be in the description of this podcast so you can check it out there and I really appreciate all of your support. So thank you everyone and have a great day and happy learning and working with your horses.